In this video, I'm going to briefly discuss Schur's lemma, which is something that's required for being able to find irreducible representations. So say we have these irreducible representations of a group G, so the primed and unprimed here, where the order of them may not be the same. Then the question is, does there exist a relationship of this form here where we have our matrix representations, matrix multiplied by some matrix X equaling our matrix multiplication X, uh, matrix multiplied by the primed version of the irreducible representations where we have, uh, we can call this G and H, so it's a G by H matrix. And so Schur's lemma tells us that if we are given these two irreducible collections of matrices uh, where the, the irreducible representation D1 is this Rn and this one is the R prime n and a postulated relationship which is this, uh, then either X contains only zeros or X is square and uh, square and non-singular. So square and non-singular. Where non-singular just means that it's invertible. That means it has an inverse under matrix multiplication. Uh, and so in other words, the order of them would have to be the same. So therefore, the only non-trivial relationship between the two irreducible collections is equivalence. In other words, the matrices differing only by a similarity transformation. All right, so if we want to get into the proof of this, so we assume that the order of <clears throat> this irreducible representation is larger than the order of this irreducible representation. Uh, and so we have these two vector spaces. So our representations have to be in these different uh, vector spaces here since they're uh, they're going to have different bases and maybe even different uh, well, they will have different dimensionality. Uh, so where V and V prime are vector spaces of dimension, so G and H respectively. And so we can write our matrix X as sort of a collection of these column vectors here. Uh, so each of those is a column of the matrix X. Uh, and so we can call these the X sub K, uh, the X sub K here in the V, the V uh, vector space. And so in general, we have, uh, you know, our order G and H, we have our G by H matrix. And so that can look something like this. So if we actually put the columns explicitly, so we have the, the components in each of these columns and the columns are numbered based on which column they are going all the way up to H. And so that would give us something that looks like this. But we see that the number of rows is G. And so uh, we are saying that G is not equal to H. And so these are not square matrices. So that's we're assuming these are not square matrices. And so the relationship of Rx equals XR prime uh, looks like this. And so we are, you know, sort of just taking the, so this, we only have the L equal one here. And so we go to the, the column K and just add all of the components down that column. So each, each row in that column. And so the X sub J are each of the H column vectors in our X. And there is a mapping which sends each of the vectors in the space V into linear combinations of themselves. And so there would be a mapping that could send these into linear combinations of themselves, uh, which are the vectors in an H dimensional subspace of the G dimensional space. Uh, remember, because our H is smaller. And so we have uh, this linear combination that has H each different components to it, well, each different uh, bases and, you know, just these arbitrary components here. But we are in a, a G-dimensional space here. And so with H being less than G, then we are now in a subspace. 
And so if we want to think about that in something a little more concrete, so if we have two basis vectors in 3D space, so each of these vectors is uh, three dimensions here, but we only have two of them, uh, then the linear combination of them cannot span the 3D space, since a vector that is a linear combination of them can only scale them without uh, with the components. And so what we are essentially doing is producing a plane that's embedded in our 2D space. So uh, we might have a plane, you know, that kind of uh, has kind of goes like this and then off into the background. Uh, I'm, I couldn't really draw that. But the, the point is we have this sort of 2D space embedded in our 3D space where, you know, that we can't have a point in our subspace that would be like right here because it has to remain in a plane that is spanned by these two different uh, vectors here. And so that's essentially what we're doing up here, but just in uh, being a little more abstract and saying that, you know, H is just some arbitrary number that's smaller than G. But if we want to think about it more concretely, we're saying we have H of these vectors, so two of these vectors, but then there are three, uh, there are three components in each of these vectors. And so uh, even though we can sort of you know, have these basis vectors sort of pointing up in different directions. They're not necessarily down in the sort of this 2D plane. They still only span a 2D plane that's just kind of in a different orientation in our 3D space. And so similarly with our more abstract version up here, we have this sort of H dimensional subspace uh, inside of our G dimensional space here. And so we required at the beginning that this, uh, this D1 and D2 irreducible representations were, in fact, irreducible. And so there cannot be an invariant subspace, as this would contradict the assumption that these are irreducible. Because remember in the previous video, uh, I talked about how uh, w when we want to sort of separate something into irreducible representations, we take a, a matrix that, you know, has a bunch of different uh, different entries here and we do you know some sort of some sort of transformation on it so that we end up with something that is block diagonalized like this where each block uh, is a is working in a subspace of our vector space and so if we can make these subspaces where you know one of them is invariant so one of them is invariant such that uh, this part of it only transforms a subspace of our vector space uh, then we're saying that that is reducible but we assumed here that that our two our two uh, irreducible representations here were in fact irreducible and so this would uh, contradict what our assumption was that that if we could end up with these subspaces so you know like the subspace that's spanned only by these two vectors uh, so the only two subspaces that would work for this are the trivial zero subspace and the subspace where g is equal to h so in the first case every column in our x would just be the zero vector so like this uh, and in the second, it requires that G equals H, uh, and that X is non-singular, i.e. invertible, so that the columns in our X define an alternative linearly independent basis that spans the whole space V. And so that's why we're saying we can't have H be smaller than G, because there has to be at least as many columns as there are rows, and alternatively, there has to be at least as many rows as there are columns, and therefore only a square matrix would satisfy this relationship. Uh, and so that is sort of the proof of Schur's lemma. Then there is, of course, the important corollary here. So the only non-trivial matrix which commutes with all the matrices of an irreducible collection of m by n matrices is a multiple of the unit matrix i sub m where m is 
the the dimensionality of the matrix there and so it would be you know the identity matrix would be you know something that just has ones going all the way down the diagonal where everything else is zero so if we have our x equaling some uh, some multiple, some scalar multiple of the identity matrix, then lambda is a non-zero eigenvalue of the non-zero matrix X. And so we have this, uh, where we can subtract them and get the zero vector there. But if X is a multiple of the unit matrix I sub M, then any number lambda I for, you know, any I there, can be an eigenvalue and therefore X can only be said to be some numerical multiple of the unit matrix. So this is because if we have this relationship that we were working with above and the R sub N and R prime sub N are equivalent under this similarity transformation, uh, then we have this where uh, we have our matrix multiplied by the X there. And then we have this because of that similarity transformation with our X right there, and so we have the R sub N X equaling this uh, X T inverse T R sub N. Uh, so the R N X equals this, uh, this scalar multiple of our identity matrix uh, with, with this eigenvalue here. And so we're saying that X uh, equaling X time, uh, mul matrix multiplied with the identity matrix is just equal to a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. And so X must be a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. And so those are kind of the two takeaways for this video is that uh, if we have some sort of relationship that's like X R equaling uh, R prime X, uh, which, you know, we can see that this is just the same as saying that X R X inverse equals R prime. And so that's a similarity transformation. So we're saying that uh, this relationship can only exist if it is a similarity relationship. And we're saying that if X uh, is commutative, which is sort of what we're showing right here, because we can uh, turn this into an R using the, the similarity uh, relationship. So if we're saying X R equals R X, uh, then, uh, and we're saying that this is true for any matrix R, uh, then X has to be a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. Because, you know, there might be maybe some non-scalar multiple of the identity matrices that do commute with our R, but if we're saying that this is the case, that this commutation is the case for any matrix, then it can only be a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. Uh, but anyway, that is Schur's lemma and its corollary. Uh, so I hope you found this video uh, interesting, and I will see you in the next one.